Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we're here to talk about Warner Brothers and its groundbreaking revolutionary role in the advent of sound in films. To the Warner Brothers, to whom is due credit for this the beginning of a new era. Which basically means that we will be talking about Warner Brothers and how it came to be one of the most prominent studios back in classic film days, back in old Hollywood days, and ended up revolutionizing the film industry with the incorporation of sound in films. Today I'm very excited because this video is part of a series that will be going on during this month of April in which we're going to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Warner Brothers and I will devote several videos to different aspects, different moments in time that I think are really important in understanding the dimension, the importance of Warner Brothers within film history and more specifically for classic films. So sit back, relax and welcome to the fascinating world of Warner Brothers and let's take a look at the moment when the magic of sound and film came together to revolutionize the movie industry. Words, mere words, oftentimes fall short of telling the whole story and we're going to take you on a little journey. In order to do that we have to travel back in time to mid 1920s and to be more exact to the year 1925. During those days also silent films reigned and audiences stormed movie theaters to go see the new release of MGM The Big Parade starring John Gilbert. Sound in films apart from the musical accompaniment of movies was pretty much a distant notion at this point, especially the possibility of recording, editing, and having playback audio recordings were developments that engineers and inventors such as Thomas Edison had been trying to accomplish and perfect right from the start of the 20th century, but despite all those efforts, still there were many technical problems in order to make them a possibility for the motion picture industry. And furthermore, all these previous attempts and prior technological developments had proven to be unsuccessful for audiences as well. So major studios were were pretty skeptical as for the impact for the real possibility and for the success of having sound films well it's just a toy it's a screen it's vulgar and in that context we have a studio again like warner brothers not at all a prominent studio by mid 1920s in fact only movies starring john barrymore and rinton tin had proven to be successful for warner brothers the studio had recently purchased brooklyn's vitagraph studios in new york and also a radio station kf WB. We have to remember here that the Warner Brothers was founded by four brothers, Harry, Samuel, Albert, and Jack. But out of all those brothers, it was Sam Warner who had the vision to take a risk on sound in films. Out of all those experiments and technical developments that I was mentioning before, there was one company, Western Electric, that developed a new sound system that consisted on the sound being recorded and issued separately. The sound goes through the cable to the box. A man records it on a big record in wax. But you have to talk into the mic first in the bush. Sam Warner saw a demonstration of that new sound system and decided to sign a contract with Western Electric. And this was the beginning of Vitaphone and so it marked the beginning of the sound venture of Warner Brothers. In order to test and introduce this new medium for films, they started creating a series of musical and talking shorts using this newly upgraded sound on film technology. Quiet please! I must be. I was the lonely one. I'm not the only one. Others have been lonely too. Maybe it had to be. She bought it had to be. Feeling unhappy and blue. But everything's so different today. Because good luck is coming my way. That certain someone is mine. That's why I want you to shine. Hello, sunshine. Hello. It is also worth mentioning that this new sound system had been presented to all the major studios before Warner Brothers and none of them wanted to even hear about implementing this somewhat then preposterous idea. Get out! 
But again, Sam Warner persevered, even though he also faced opposition within Warner Brothers itself because his brother Harry was also cautious and skeptical about risking more money in talking films. All this culminated a year later in 1926 with the premiere of the film Don Juan, starring John Barrymore and Mary Astor, which was released with a series of musical shorts featuring several prominent musicians, even the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, and also a speech by Will Hayes, whose name would forever be associated with the Hayes Code, but who in this instance introduced this new sound system, which applied to Don Juan, consisted in a self-included music score and sound effects, and sound for all these shorts also that were shown prior to the movie. The film received a very good response, but what really captured the audience's imagination and left the public in awe were precisely these musical shorts and pretty much capitalized the attention and the praise from audiences who, with the increasing popularity of radio and also gramophones, became more and more eager for sound and eventually for talking pictures. What Warner Brothers did best at the stage was to combine this new sound system with showmanship that captured again the interest from audiences. It was not just about sound, it was also about who was singing, who was talking, and how this sound was presented. And that is something that Sam Warner, that Warner Brothers saw very well and was confirmed with the release in 1927 of The Jazz Singer with both synchronized recorded music and speech. Not throughout the whole film, but still is considered the first feature length talking picture. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you. You ain't heard nothing. And as many of you know, the jazz singer was a resounding, pun intended, success. <laughs> It broke box office records, but despite all those efforts, one major downside was the untimely passing of Sam Warner, who had, as I said, championed this idea of having sound in films one day before the New York premiere of The Jazz Singer. His brothers, though, continued with his idea. Still, the major studios thought that sound in films was a fad, that it wouldn't last. There was also the technical difficulty of this sound system synchronization problems oh. Oh. Right. what's that the sound it's out of synchronization oh oh my god i must fly to her side constrictions in terms of how it had to be filmed, exhibiting problems. Nevertheless, progress is progress. They decided to push through and seeing the enormous success of The Jazz Singer, they repeated the formula immediately with a movie like The Singing Fool, also starring Al Jolson and released in 1928. This was a power move and solidified the success for Warner Brothers, further convincing critics and audiences that talking pictures were the future. Warner Brothers also released in 1928 the film Lights of New York that became the first all-talking full-length feature film and at this point the enthusiasm the craze for talking pictures was on fire warner brothers also wanted to incorporate technicolor as well it was a case of giving as much as you could to audiences and so they released also a movie like on with the show a pre-code musical film with different musical sketches considered to be the first all-talking all-color feature length film and the second color film released by Warner Brothers. However, On With The Show is not preserved in its entirety in color, but we still can enjoy this fantastic bits like this one with Ethel Waters singing Am I Blue. Am I blue? And so, after all these releases, by the end of 1920s and starting 1930, Hollywood was effectively talking and ended up producing sound films exclusively. So that was no small feat, and as you can see, Warner Brothers had a key role in bringing sound to films, but also sound was key in turn in making Warner Brothers the major studio that it became and that still is. And in regards to Vitaphone, as I said before, it was a very 
complicated system to maintain. So even though they pioneered bringing sound in films, Warner Brothers ended up switching to RCA Photophone sound on film recording and Vitaphone continued to produce though some of the most amazing shorts that were produced at that time. And I think that's worth remembering as well because they are on the one hand a wonderful record of the last days of vaudeville also later shorts show the music that was listened to in the 30s and the 40s a great example of the orchestras back then you take the high road and i take the low road and i'll be in scotland It is wonderful to see people actually dancing and singing these songs. There are also several videos featuring female orchestras, which is quite wonderful too. Many black performers, even the first shorts of Sammy Davis Jr. and some really impressive shorts, some that I've shared through Instagram and Twitter, featuring Cap Calloway and other very talented and legendary musicians. You can see also the Nicholas Brothers. Many of these shorts as well had a common denominator that I was particularly happy to discover, which is that many were directed by Jean Negulesco, and you can really tell because the music shorts that were directed by him have a different artistic quality, and they are quite amazing to see. Also, some of these shorts are a wonderful testament of how the studio would promote movies back in the 1930s. There is a particularly brilliant short specifically dedicated to the release of a Midsummer Night's Dream in which you can see the premiere but also how the film was made and also you can discover the early films from people like June Allison, John Garfield, and even Eleanor Parker. These Vitaphone shorts became really a fixture in movie theater programs throughout the 30s and the 40s especially, but they were also best remembered for releasing the first Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies cartoons. So that is why I thought that in order to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Warner Brothers, we really had to take a look back at this particular moment in time and at this wonderful short to also commemorate the work of everyone who contributed to films and having sound in film. So that's all for today's video. I hope that you enjoyed. I will leave a link down below to everything I'm referencing in today's video, which is quite a lot. I guarantee you that checking Vitaphone shorts is a treat. I hope that you have once again enjoyed today's video and that you'll join me in all the future videos and the celebration for Warner Brothers 100th anniversary. As always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for your love for classic movies. And also, take care, stay safe, and see you soon with another video. Bye!